So then I will invite the moderator of this next part. So it's Pete Jackson. He's the executive director from uh, Infect Therapeutics. So he's a well-known stakeholder in the space. So probably known by everybody here. So welcome you, Pete, back on stage again on in this uh, platform. And Thank then you, Sandra. I hand over to you then for the next panel, which is then very much focusing more on the early stage part, but there are some new stuff arising and uh, stakeholders coming into the scene. So looking forward to hear from those news then. Great. Uh, hello, everyone. And uh, thanks very much for the invitation to participate in this excellent panel. Uh, we've, we've heard already uh, about the uh, the, the great initiatives that are happening with, with investment. And now uh, we'd like to look at the uh, incubators and, and public-private uh, collaborations to accelerate uh, our pipeline. Uh, we've got a, uh, an outstanding set of contributors in Anders, Erin, uh, Douglas and Igor. Um, and uh, we're going to ask each of them to do a 10 minute presentation on their particular uh, area. Um, it'd be great to get some some really good questions from the participants in the chat. And uh, at, uh, at the end, we'll have a, a, the opportunity to, to pick up your questions and, um, um, and have a discussion about those and, and any, any other things that come up in the in the in the presentations. So um, First of all, if you don't know me, I'm Pete Jackson. I'm the uh, exec director at Infect Therapeutics, which was formerly known as the, the AMR Center. We changed our name last year. I, I'm proud to serve on the uh, project advisory group for the UK's pull incentive with NHS England and, and NICE. And I'm also a, a, an advisor on AMR for the Milken Institute in, in DC. Uh, and uh, you, you'll have heard yesterday from Janet Hemingway about the ICON initiative, which is a, now over a $200 million um, infection innovation consortium in the UK. Uh, Infects is, is a, a co-founder of, of ICON, and I, I serve on the board of that, and uh, in particular look after a Hits to Lead program, which is a, a, an early stage accelerator program. Uh, as well as um, a translational uh, platform looking at getting programs into phase one quickly, and particularly in respiratory infections. So I, I'd um, uh, definitely uh, recommend anyone to take a take a look at um, Janet's presentation from yesterday to find out more about ICON. Um, so um, without further ado, um, I'd like to invite the uh, other uh, speakers to to join us and Anders is going to kick us off with his uh, presentation so uh, Anders over to you please thank you Pete can you hear me yeah perfect okay perfect thank you all so thank you for the invitation to to present to you the IMI, IMI AMR accelerator and I'm the project coordinator of one of the projects within this accelerator. Uh, but just let me give you first some key facts about this. So the AMR accelerator is, is um, the IMI2 initiative. It's, it's, as you all probably all know, this is a public-private partnership where FBI contributes with 50%, mostly in within kind uh, support, while uh, the commission or the European taxpayers uh, provides the remaining 50%. So uh, the accelerator was set up, uh, started in 2019, and it consists of eight individual projects. So each one of these projects have their own aim, aims. They have their own timeline when they will be working in the accelerator. They have their own uh, budget and their own management teams. So uh, the, uh, the accelerator is, a, is an umbrella organization for the eight individual projects. And within these projects, we have 13 antibacterial programs running at the moment. There is a combined budget of almost of a half a billion euro. Uh, there's 82 participants combined within these eight projects coming from 16 countries. 
And uh, the first project started in 2019, and Unite for TB, which, which joined uh, June this summer, which is the newest project in the accelerator, will go on until 2028. So uh, what are the objectives of this uh, accelerator? So it's, it's basically to push the, the antibacterial pipeline. And the aim is to, by 2028, they will have developed 10 preclinical candidates and have phase, five phase two ready assets available. So uh, the Unite for TB program, program project, which just joined, will conduct phase two clinical trials. So that, that's a new uh, facet to this. We'll, run projects all, all the way through phase two. Uh, but also to foster a wide range and series of projects that yeah addresses many of the scientific challenges in AMR. So yes, let's just take a quick glimpse on the different projects. As you can see from this overview, there are different timelines. For instance, uh, ABLE Direct is expected to end by 2021. Uh, it has seven partners while uh, uh, the combined project, which I am coordinating, uh, is expected to run until 2025, and it has 11 partners. So several or three of these projects are running TB projects, era for tb uh, Respiratory tb and TRIC-TB. And, uh, and then, of course, Unite for TB will be running uh, TB uh, phase two clinical studies. But we also have GNA now, which is running gram-negative uh, projects. Uh, so there's a diversity uh, of, of projects within the accelerator. You can also see that the budgets differ cons uh, considerably in between the projects, between 3.7 million euro to uh, ERA 4TB, which has the, the largest budget with 200, more than 207 million euro. So if we look at the pipeline, if you can see this, this is, this is the current pro portfolio of the accelerator. And you can see there are three gram-negative projects here running within GNA now. Uh, let's see. What happened now? Okay, there's three projects there. Uh, and they are uh, all no new class, new mode of action projects. And they are in different phases, in the lead to candidate, candidate phase one, and uh, uh, in, in the lead to candidate. So you can see here from this overview, Many of the projects have new mode of actions, new classes. They are in different phases. And currently there are three projects running in phase one. So probably the largest uh, project here is ERA 4TB, which has uh, several uh, projects in, in clinical, well, two projects in clinical trials. And uh, they also have the asset owner or for, for instance, from GSK. Uh, we have uh, from uh, TB Alliance, uh, and also from Drug Discovery Unit at Dundee University. So here you can see the asset owners of, of the different uh, projects running in the, in the, uh, um, in the accelerator. Uh, so the role of, let's see, I'll come over there. So if you look at the scope, uh, it's, as you can understand, it has a broad sense integrating both TB with other AMR diseases. And of course, then it targets gram-negative bacteria, bacteria and MTB and also non-tuberculosis mycobacteria. Uh, as you saw, there's a wide range of programs in the pipeline from discovery to end of phase one. So there's also respiratory uh, TB has hit identification uh, work ongoing. Uh, and we are also harmonizing, so in combine, uh, which is, a little bit special project because it has no um, assets by, by, by our own in the pipeline. Instead, we, we have the role to, uh, uh, to uh, both, both an administrative role, but also scientific role. And the administrative role is to help the other projects with IT support, with data management, harmonizing data sets, handling of those, uh, also dissemination, uh, getting the whole accelerator together into to kind of a, a, a common a, a unity or a family, so to say. But we also have uh, scientific uh, projects in the sense that we are trying to standardize a, a, a mouse pneumonia model to make that into a standardized uh, 
a model that can be used then by others, hopefully, so that we define what variables uh, often vary, and we will then set the criteria for 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 hopefully uh, uh, getting more reproducible and ammonia models going forward. And uh, we will also conduct a ring study there when we have set the variables to to see on the variation. But we're also looking at at uh, data sets, both preclinical data sets and, and clinical data sets, and trying to understand and, and optimize the transition in between those and, and generate new learnings. So, as I said, there are 82 participants. Uh, you see they're spread out in Europe here, but there's also uh, from, from US, uh, we have GSK, of course, here, and we have TB Alliance which, and, and Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, which are associated partners. And uh, I think that kind of brings me to the acknowledgement slide and to the final slide. I'd like to thank you for listening. Thank you. Thank you, Anders. Maybe uh, just one question for me before we move on to, to the next speaker. Um, you describe, for example, the development of new platforms such as the uh, pneumonia model. Uh, how, how can companies that are interested in that engage and be able to get access to that so we had a actually we had a webinar earlier this spring where we had invited i think we had more than 80 participants so that was by invitation open and uh, now we are trying to work on on both gathering the information from that webinar where where also uh, participants share their 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 knowledge but also we've done an inventory in the literature and we're now trying to get all these together into a, a, a kind of a, a definition of what we believe is a good way of doing this but i would uh, those that are interested in in contributing here to contact me for instance and then i will uh, provide the contacts to lena freeberg uh, one of those who are leading that that work in the work package five but please contact me and i will uh, provide the, the correct contact Okay, Anders, thank, thank you. That, that's, that's very helpful. And if there are any more questions uh, for Anders, please put them in the chat uh, and we'll come back to them in the, in the panel discussion at the end. So uh, thank you, Anders. And uh, I'd now like to move on to Erin, who's going to tell us about Carvex. Hello, everybody, and, and thank you. I'm very delighted to be in this session. My name is Erin Duffy, and I'm the head of research and development at Carbex. I hope I'm going to be able to advance these slides. What happened here? Uh, OK. Um, so thought I'd start by, uh, you know, they always say a picture is worth a thousand words. And here we have two that I think capture the five years of Carbex. So how it started was with Kevin Outerson. Uh, teaming up with John Rex and Barry Eisenstein to write um, a responsive proposal to a broad agency announcement by BARDA uh, to create a biopharmaceutical accelerator focused on combating antimicrobial resistance. Five years later, um, we have funded 92 separate projects uh, in many countries. I'll show you on the next slide um, and have advanced them meaningfully. So here are the numbers uh, for Carbex. So again, uh, you know, we are focused from the hit to lead currently through a first in human demonstration of safety uh, and, and drug levels. Um, we are focused very much on three pillars, therapeutics, prevention, and diagnostics. We've invested or are investing, I should say, approximately $480 million uh, between the years 2016 and 2022. Uh, to accelerate these programs in, in the areas that I mentioned. Our focus has been uh, started on the resistant bacteria named on the WHO and CDC uh, bacterial threats list. We are completely non-dilutive. I think everyone knows that. Uh, and we do have a company cost share that's dependent on the stage of development. I'll underscore that as we are in the fifth year of a five-year grant, uh, new rounds will only be possible when and if new funding is received. Uh, I don't think it's a big secret um, because I think Kevin has tweeted it, but we have indeed applied um, to BARDA uh, for the broad agency announcement that was released earlier this year. So again, 92 projects to date. 
Uh, we have uh, deployed, uh, not obligated, but spent rather about 343 million of that 480. The projects cover 12 countries. Today, there are 59 active projects, again, spanning those three pillars. And in terms of some metrics of output, uh, we have had eight therapeutic and prevention first in human completions. Uh, in diagnostics, we've had four that have crested the validation and verification and subsequently have gone into clinical trials uh, in two cases with CE marks in Europe and on their way to regulatory approval in the US. We've had nine project graduates. What does a graduate mean? It means successful completion uh, of these programs and then um, entry into advanced development, either with um, the company or with an advanced development partner. Uh, and I'll emphasize that in the final Chevron there, we have had two graduates who have gone on to have advanced development partnerships with BARDA. Okay, so in the portfolio of 59, again, crossing three pillars, we have 36 treatment programs. 19 of those are your classic small molecule direct acting antibiotic programs, where all but one of them are focused on a new class and or a new mechanism of inhibition or action. Uh, there is one that is an enhancement to a known class. And I always like to say, that innovation is really in the eye of the beholder. And if one can enhance the performance characteristics of an existing class, that is also innovative and, and should be considered as we heard uh, just recently in the last session. 16 of the 36 treatment programs are indeed non-traditional and that crosses many different uh, modalities from monoclonal antibodies, proteins, peptides, antivirulents, uh, bacteriophage, all engineered in this case. Uh, and as I mentioned, uh, we've had four, we've had eight total first in human programs. Today, we have four active first in human programs. In prevention, we have a total of 12 projects. The lion's share of those are vaccine projects. So we're really doubling down on AMR for vaccines, focused on you know, both pathogens for which vaccines have been uh, rather elusive, and then also uh, supporting the basic biology to support their further advancement. We have three decolonization programs. These feature live biotherapeutic or microbiome uh, modifying agents and two engineered phage programs. And additionally, we do have one monoclonal antibody program in prevention. Finally, and, and no less important, uh, are, is our uh, diagnostics platform focused on rapid bacterial ID and AST, including AMR. Uh, two of those programs presently are in their last stage of development with us, which is validation, uh, validation and verification. Okay, um, you know, it's not often that, that one gets to crow about being on the cover of a journal, so allow me to do that. If you haven't seen the latest ACS uh, in Journal of Infectious Diseases issue, you should. Uh, the issue is on antibiotic alternatives. We were invited to submit a perspective. We did so on that non-traditional portfolio that I mentioned recently and, and were uh, invited to, to have the cover art. Um, what you see here, and, and this is you know, meant to spur some discussion, but in the middle is a bar graph of those 16 programs. And then here are some um, product developer companies submitted um, uh, graphics to go along with their programs. The point of this is to say that as we've matured as an organization, we've moved away from taking uh, all commerce programs to having thematic foci uh, for the purpose of de-risking or unlocking value, particularly in areas that have been elusive or for which there isn't a well-trodden uh, discovery, let alone regulatory and clinical path. And so in every one of these areas that I mentioned, antivirulents, proteins, peptides, uh, phage, et cetera, we've invested in more than one program, more than one target, different stages of development, different pathogens, and importantly, different indication folks die. The point of which is to understand how to drive these novel, uh, truly novel programs forward and harvest value in terms of progress uh, and products out of them. You heard a little bit about this from Anders. Uh, so we feel particularly in these areas of high risk, 
that you need more than money. Um, you know, Carbex is certainly good at giving out funding. We're never going to be as good as someone like the Wellcome Trust, but that's not why uh, the Wellcome Trust and BARDA and others have invested in us. They've invested in us additionally to support these programs scientifically and, and with business wraparound services. In the last year, uh, with the internal R&D team that we've built at Carbex, we've kicked off what we're calling cross-project opportunities, could also be called capability science building, which is something um, that the IMI combined group uh, talks about, and, and Anders mentioned uh, the respiratory animal models of infection. Uh, for us, you know, we have initiate, initiated a number of cross-project opportunities to support the portfolio. So from left to right, uh, this the, on the left is focused primarily on our treatment portfolio, where we're looking through uh, susceptibility studies on a very large panel of contemporary isolates, uh, early evaluation of pre-existing resistance. Uh, we also, through uh, you know, genomic databases, are doing consistent assessment of or sorry, in the middle there, uh, early evaluation of antigenic variability risk. This is both for the prevention portfolio, as you can imagine, with vaccines, but also for a non-traditional portfolio. Uh, back um, in, in the yellow there, we have a series of activities focused on consistent assessment of key safety risks. For instance, nephrotoxicity has been a challenge for peptides and, and other projects uh, generally, and so we're looking at what are the suite of tools in vitro and or in vivo that will best reflect uh, what is seen clinically and, and in uh, market use and to be able to then deploy those or employ those in the programs that we're prosecuting. We as well are looking at improved animal models of infection with a particular emphasis on back translation, meaning of course uh, those uh, antibiotics that have been or are used clinically, both that have been successful and failures, um, so that we can best understand how to deploy those and, and what the key markers are um, to declare success. In, in our case, uh, we have emphasized primarily urinary tract models of infection and gonorrhea uh, for the simple reasons that there have been some recent NCE failures, and the question is why and how do we understand that in these models? And finally, and this is very focused on our vaccines program, access to novel adjuvants. Of course, um, a lot of these are proprietary and how do we bring those to early development so that we can best assess how to drive vaccines forward. We've had, I, I would like to highlight because I think this is something we're going to talk about later in this session. We've had some very interesting preliminary discussions with the group uh, at IMI combined, including Anders Group and, and very much facilitated by Karen O'Dwyer and look forward to finding ways that we can in fact work together to enhance our portfolios, all with the purpose of driving towards products uh, that are primed for advanced development. Uh, this is uh, a concept that, that Kevin has, has coined recently and I really like it. If you think about the continuum of science necessary to bring products to patients, Certainly over the years, there's been a lot of good investment and a lot of great output from basic research and early discovery. You see the groups here, JPIAMR, NIAID, uh, BMBF, the German government, uh, and others. In the middle, of course, is where uh, we sit and others, which is then to take that basic science, translate it into uh, discovery and early development. So again, um, from hit to lead in, in the case of uh, therapeutics and prevention through a first in human uh, demonstration and, and a similar um, progression from feasibility to validation and verification and diagnostics. Uh, we're certainly joined by IMI, IMI Enable and the Accelerator, uh, as well as Nova Repair. And then finally, of course, and we just heard this from the last session, clinical development, which includes many players, BARDA, Guard P, the AMR Action Fund, IMI Combat, and uh, potentially HERA. And of course, again, um, you know, we, we are very cognizant that if we aren't in the middle, then where do you have that link between great science and something that's going to be meaningful to patients? Of course, to maintain those links, we have some obligations here, and, and we can't uh, just focus on targeting the pathogens that are on the CDC and WHO list, but we need to ask ourselves the question, where is the real unmet need? Um, you know, what are those key indications and syndromes? And so then 
below that, what are the key pathogens that are found in those syndromes so that we understand that these projects cover those well. Can't emphasize enough the impact of performance characteristics. And, and this is really all that other stuff in the target product profile from uh, dosing route, dosing regimen, safety credentials, cost of goods, et cetera. And so if, if you're not thinking of these early in development, once you're in the clinic, uh, it becomes very difficult to change those. And so, you know, I'll give you an example that we hear a lot today, which is a group comes in, it hits a lead, they start, they're going to cover everything, all the escape pathogens, let's say. Um, and the next thing you know, um, you know, the science drives them towards coverage of enterobacteriales only, which is fine, but then they can't have an oral form, they're at an IV, and so do we need another IV CUTI drug unclear? Uh, and so we really want to be mindful of all of these things as we move forward. Additionally, we, we really want to maintain a focus not only on high income countries, but also on low middle income countries where, of course, uh, the burden is disproportionate. And then finally, an emphasis on stewardship objectives. Final note about Carvex, I mentioned this, we are in the fifth year of a five year mandate. We are using the remaining uh, resources of that 480 million, million that I mentioned to continue to accelerate the programs in portfolio. Uh, we are very actively pursuing funding and, and discussing options with additional funders as well. Last year, we undertook a strategic review and have developed a strategic plan to shape the future um, investment priorities. And finally, uh, we do anticipate new funding rounds, but of course, they will only be held after new funding for Carvex is secured. And with that, I thank you very much, and I look forward to the discussion. That's great, Erin. Thank you. Thank you very much for that great presentation. Again, just uh, maybe uh, one one quick question. You 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 touched on it at the end. I think everybody's um, uh, really keen to hear uh, when you expect to find out about the uh, the coffers being refilled. <laughs> Good question. So, uh, according to the broad agency announcement, um, the selection of a group. Um, would be in the fall here. We, we like that to be earlier rather than later. Um, and, and if we are chosen, there would obviously be a negotiation period. Um, but you know, we're very hopeful that a disposition for whoever is the biopharmaceutical accelerator for this uh, is chosen. And, and in the ideal case, it would be we. <laughs> oh, I think you, you have the uh, best, best wishes of, of the majority of, if not all the attendees, uh, in that endeavor area and so uh, 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 good luck with that um, because we will be picking up on on some of the points that you you made in your presentation later in the panel discussion um, but i'd now like to move on and ask douglas to uh, start his presentation uh, if you don't mind douglas hello that's all good great um Hello and welcome. I'm only seeing my cover slide, not my present. Here's my presentation. Great. Um, thanks, Peter. And, and thank you to Anders and Aaron for highlighting something um, that I think is really important. And we at Incades think are very important, which is that bringing the next generation of antibiotic therapies and diagnostics to market is a team game. Um, and hopefully, um, we're bringing something today that adds to this landscape and is an interesting link in the chain or maybe oils the chain or, or I'm not sure which analogy you want to use, but is something that adds to the landscape. That's the most important thing. Um, what we're trying to do is support innovators to fight drug-resistant bacterial infections. And the idea there is that we think by placing innovators in the focus and the group of people that actually bring a drug device or tool to market is going to make a difference and is, and is going to be an interesting way to support innovation. We are um, oh, these four people uh, in the management team and the organisations that stand behind them and a number of partners which we can tell you about uh, as we go along. And we make up uh, INCATE, which is the Incubator for Antibacterial Therapies Europe. We are Helmut Kessman from NCCR Anti-Resist, Silke Alt from DZIF, um, Florian Kloss from 
Impact Control and myself from the Innovation Office at the University of Basel. And the other three have got 20 years of experience in developing businesses and research in antibiotics. Um, I've done some drug development, but I've spent most of my time talking to people and building communities of entrepreneurs. And that's um, what we're trying to build, which is a community of entrepreneurs. Um, we'd love you to follow us on Twitter and LinkedIn at Incate Europe and join us uh, and have a look at the website and fill in our contact form there. Um, where we can get in contact with you. Now, the challenge, I think we've all seen a version of this and uh, we had a discussion earlier today about whether there's any point getting over um, these mountains. Um, but I think, you know, the glass is half full or at least being filled. So I think there will be an interesting time when we can get across this valley of death. And this Valley of Death is between research institutions and industry, which both have resources, culture and skills and capabilities. And what we're trying to do is be the connection between those two places. Um, and the way we want to connect is through advice, community and funding. Um, so the advice part of that is about aligning with market needs and building a quality translational plan. When the industry left antibiotics and wasn't involved, a couple of things have happened. One of them is academics have been left alone to do development, and that doesn't necessarily always lead to a strong alignment with market needs. What um, we also happened was a lot of really talented people weren't working on antibiotics anymore, and we'd like to bring some of that industry talent back around making a strong translational plan. We also think community is very important. We think it's important to can make connections between those people already working on antibiotics. And for example, with um, Combine and Erin's talk about those capabilities, that's the kind of thing we're talking about. But we're also talking about inspiring the next generation of people. So how do we get that researcher to decide to actually commercialize their product? And and to, and think that they have something that's worth working on, whether that's a therapy or a diagnostic or another tool. We'll also provide some funding to answer critical questions. So we'll we have up to two hundred and fifty thousand in non dilutive funding, um, and that won't solve anyone's problems. But what it will do is help to answer quest, critical questions that will enable that group of innovators to become investable to move along to the next link in the chain. And that's how, that's the in-cake model. Um, the way those pieces fit together is, is this. We have advice and community, which will try and be as inclusive as possible in the community and provide advice to anyone who wants to, to reach out to us. When they're ready, we'll, we will ask people to apply for stage one funding, which is a period of up to six months where there's coaching, um, some sponsored services to begin to define the milestones and business case so that we can make a good choice at stage two, which is around a larger amount of funding. And in stage two, it's about building that company and, and, answering, and answering the key questions that will make that um, innovation investable. So that's how the pieces fit together. Um, and one of the questions we get is around selection. And this is what it could look like. We could have the in-case selection committee and we have great academic people. Um, we could have the, indust the industrial partners as well. And the combination of academia and industry would be great and they'd make some good selections. But I was really excited to hear from Erin some of the same thoughts, which is we also need to add a global health perspective, an access perspective, the perspective of providers, um, payers, um, and also the entrepreneurs themselves. Like, what is it that's necessary to actually get people across that across that gap? So that's what the selection committee will try and um, and include. We'll be uh, telling you more about that in October. Who do we want to have in uh, in Incate? 
Um, we've stolen this one with pride from our friends at Beam Alliance, so a shout out to Mark there. Um, and the idea here is to show that we know there are going to be many modalities that are important in the fight against drug-resistant bacterial infections, um, and we want to see how we can help all of them. Um, we're beginning with a focus on the cure and, and new therapeutics, but we'd also like to hear from others that have different ideas and, and see whether we can help. Um, in terms of stage, it's about people who are beginning the translational journey and early stage startups. And they're the people we think we can help most. Others, you know, please join the community. Let's have a discussion. Let's see whether making, if we stand in the middle and make a connection between industry partners and a already working company, that's great. You know, that's success for us. We don't have to bring people into our program. We want to be additive and, and build a community. So that's the who can get involved. And I'd now like to talk about and tell you who our, our partners are and a little bit how we came up with, with this model. Um, the INCATE team has been talking to various people, some of whom have, have um, presented today and yesterday, and what is the problem and what's missing? And it was that connection to pharmaceutical companies, connection to, to know-how. Um, and uh, that's what we're trying to build. So these people said you need to, to bring um, translation skills uh, and build a community and be Europe-wide, and that's what we've, we've put together. And who we are is um, three pieces. The first piece is academic members. We have, um, we're actually sitting today in the new biocentre and building in Basel together with the academic members. And we'd love to be meeting you in person, but that will have to wait until April. Um, and so they bring academic knowledge and we'd love to have more academic partners. Um, as nice as Switzerland and Germany are, they're not Europe. We'd like to, to, be, to be broader than, than that. And, and we like to, to see some more academic partners. We also have industry partners. We have three industry partners who've joined today and they provide funding and also an interest in, in working together to make connections and support these companies and innovators. And we also, and there's the three of them, Boeing, Ingelheim Venture Fund, Roche and Chianogi, and we're really excited to have them on board. And there's a, another one we, we can, answer, we can uh, release shortly. And we'd like to speak to more. Like I think the more people in the community, the better it will be. We also have a number of supporting partners who are, as you can see, the other links in the chain. These are the people that will help during Incate and will help post Incate to bring these innovations to market. So a reminder, we're about providing advice, community and funding to innovators so that they can bring forward new innovations to fight drug-resistant bacterial infections. And now that's all from me and us. Um, and we'd love to talk to you. That's the next step. Um, we would like you, the antibiotic community, um, to reach out to us on Twitter and LinkedIn, follow us, um, go to the website and sign up for our contact page, reach out to us directly. Um, we'd love to talk to you and understand what you need and how we can help. Peter. That's excellent, Douglas. Thank you very much. Uh, that's a, a, a superb initiative. Uh, and uh, if, if you could you just remind us again of the uh, what you hope and anticipate the, the the overall budget that you might have to deploy in in this initiative over the uh, over the next few years. So we're we're aiming for about a million a year in non dilutive funding, uh, and then we will also have a, a sort of a running budget because um, the idea is to we need to be able to build that community and provide advice. And some of that will be fund provided by uh, our founding member institutions, the, uni the universities that we work in, plus some phil philanthropic partners who are already supporting on that. And we'd like more of that. Um, but we'd like to have a budget of around about a million in non-dilutive funding that will support three or four companies in a meaningful way and bring along an, a more of a pipeline. Yeah, excellent. That's uh, uh, uh Good luck with that, and I'm sure it will it will gather momentum and uh, and new contributors, and and we'll we'll talk about how um, 
all of our activities can coordinate and cooperate uh, late, later in the panel discussion. Uh, so, so thank you for that. And can I now ask Igor to join us and uh, uh, as the fourth contributor uh, and tell us about the initiatives at iCuris. Igor, I'm not hearing you. Hello, can you hear me now? We've got you. Super, yeah, so I'm back. Perfect. Uh, so thank you very much. Uh, I would like to tell a, bit, a little bit about uh, our company, Corporate Incubator, iCubator. Uh, we successfully launched this project at our last um, at uh, last MR conference uh, in 2020, and I would like to share maybe some results and some of the insights uh, what we managed to achieve during the last year and what could be our future plans. So, in general, uh, the whole concept of the incubator is uh, the idea that is I would say pretty similar to what was presented by D Douglas uh, for the INCATE. So we s that we see a lot of uh, scientific program programs that are very interesting, very attractive, but in many reasons, uh, for, due to many reasons, they do not survive to the stage where would to be they would be interesting for pharmaceutical companies. And we would like to help these projects to move them forward and for that purpose, we created our incubator, and within this incubator, we provide scientific support, business expertise, and financial advisory in terms of where to get the financing, how to move forward. In general, uh, we, I mean, we are not a very big company. We are about 70 people, and we can support, we would like to provide a very high quality support. So every year we select up to three residents. And as I said, they uh, get the support in terms of the science, uh, business, and financial advisory. And they have a certain number of obligations. They need to progress in their projects. So we support the projects uh, from one up to three years. And I'll say one of the key criteria here is the progress. So if the project moves forward, we provide the support up to three years. Uh, we don't provide longer support because we think that within three years, the project either will be at the stage where we say, okay, the project is attractive for us and of the stage for direct in licensing, or the project will be probably moving too slow. And then we say, sorry, it's not attractive for us to in license the project. So according to, in addition to progress, project need to report their progress for us to be able to evaluate the results. And one of the obligations, so since we don't uh, invest in the projects, we don't get the stake in the project. So we spend only our, I would say our time and resources. And for that, we get uh, the right of the first offer for the project that are willing to uh, become a incubator resident. So at the stage when the project is willing to receive uh, investment or to consider uh, out licensing, then we have the right of the first offer to make a proposal within uh, two months. And based on that, to, so if we say no or don't provide any reaction, then in this case, project is free to go on the free market. So uh, Icubator started in 2020, uh, right in the middle of pandemic times, and uh, the launch of the Incubator was linked to the uh, in parallel, as a part of our uh, iCourse pandemic preparedness campaign in June 2020. Uh, our call was in Q4, where we received uh, slightly less than 20 applications. And major topics were gram negative resistance break and antibiotics and certain viral indications. So, as I said, we received a number of uh, applicants. Uh, there were products in virology and bacteriology. I would say in general, it was 50-50. So uh, about half of the projects were from bacteriology. Uh, three out of four projects were from biotech and only 25% were from academic groups. And we received project 
definitely we received a lot of projects from Germany, Austria, Switzerland. There were also some US projects. Uh, as a result, three projects were selected to become uh, incubator residents, and they are project uh, company Prokaryotics from US, company Selmot from Switzerland, and a uh, scientific project from uh, University of Essen focusing on the antiviral field on the interference. Every of these project is uh, unique, has his its own uh, features and needs, and we try to re work really personalized with these projects to move them forward, to support them in terms of, of finding their way to, uh, to create future drugs and or in some cases find to meet the requirements, for example, to ask for certain financing. So if we look back on the uh, result of the last year, we, say, we can say that uh, in general, there is a high interest from the startups and scientific groups to participate in this story because it's really can cover their needs when they, and uh, I would say our flexible approach is really helps us to uh, move forward uh, with every project uh, very specialized. So we managed to find the clear deliverables for the IQ Beta residents for the first year, but also, there were some challenges. So one of the things that this model is new, and in some cases, it's what it required really a very detailed explanation and personal discussion uh, to move forward. Uh, the rights and the limitation in context of grant financing from the third parties also can be need to be clarified in some cases. So there were projects that didn't want to participate because they were afraid that it could, I would say, block them from getting uh, additional non dilutive financing for the projects. And in general, I would say there are also some uh, cases in terms of the legal framework, especially if we have a not a dual party, but a three party agreement where we have a combination of, uh, for example, university and the startup. And with, with this, it's, it's it really requires some time for alignment. But in general, I would say the project is successful and we definitely plan to launch the second call uh, this year. So uh, we identified the topics for the first call during the third quarter, uh, have a second call for the project in the fourth quarter, and since the beginning of year 2022, we'll have up to three additional residents. So that's pretty much it. Thank you very much for your time. Ready to open any questions. Uh, great, Igor. Thank, thanks for uh, explaining that. And um, uh, it's 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 great that you're giving us an, an update after after the first year of, of the uh, uh, accelerator in operation um uh, just to just to clarify the uh, you're providing in-kind uh, contributions so it's the 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 uh the staff and the experts within iQuris that are that will be working on these programs is that correct yeah, that's correct. And uh, the scope of this in-kind contribution is uh, really uh, depend on the on the needs of the project. So there could be uh, support of our IP experts, or for some projects there are, there is a requirement of our pharmacology and tox experts. In some cases, we, they need support in terms of the chemistry. We also do provide some uh, small non-dilutive uh, financing uh, that is. It's it's really a small amount, so it's uh, ten thousand uh, euros per project uh, as a single payment. But it's also useful for some projects because they have high level of flexibility in terms of how they spend this money. So in in some cases, it's much easier for them to do a certain job uh, and certain provide certain do certain activities in order to get new data and, for example, to be eligible for the grant financing for with the new data. Great, thank you. So, um, Igor, if I, could, if I could ask you to join um, the other presenters now on our panel, and we have uh, a, 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 just about half an hour to discuss some of the things that have been raised and, and so that some other elements. Um, I, the question I just asked um, Igor really was uh, you know, about uh, who's providing the expertise and um and the know-how knowledge and experience here and, and of course the a, a curious folk have that alex engels in the in the previous uh, session said one of the greatest threats to us is is the lack of availability of talent 
our talent drain, getting new people to come into into the area. Um, could, could, could each of you comment, please, on uh, what you see from your from the initiatives that you're undertaking? You know how how we're going to increase the talent base uh, across the world in uh, and, and bring researchers and uh, and scientists and experts into uh, this mission that we're all undertaking. And maybe Erin, if you could, you could kick us off there. Sure, I'd be happy to. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, got you. Okay, great. Um, so I, I think we've been really um, uh, pleasantly surprised through the many funding calls that we've had, including we had four uh, in the year 2019. Um, just how many groups are out there um, who are still doing this? Most of them very small. Um, you know, I, I don't remember the mean number of, of a Carbex uh, company, but they range from literally five guys in a storage bin to large pharmaceutical companies and everywhere in between. Um, so we're seeing that. I think um, you know a key element for us is you know we we have what we call our global accelerator network um, that you know we have representation around the world and 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 these groups part of what they do is to promote. Uh, within their networks or countries, uh, Carbex and, and what we do and the types of funding calls we have to really encourage people who may have very interesting technology that could be um, developed into a product to, to apply with us. And, and then they certainly help them to do so. Uh, so I think that's critical is to get the word out. Um, and then, you know, once they are in portfolio, you know, we do provide what we call a company support team where we wrap around that team, subject matter experts, members from the Global Accelerator Network, and also the internal R&D team at Carbex to really help develop them from early stage researchers to antibiotic drug developers. And, and I think by doing that, we hope that it will sustain or at least promote uh, interest in the environment. Great, thank you. And, and, and as um, you know, developing networks and Capabilities uh, an important theme. Um, what are your uh, What are your hopes uh, to, to uh, for your networks to be able to create a new generation of, of researchers and developers? Well, I, I guess uh, academics as well as uh, biotechs are going where the money is. So I think these long term initiatives that we now see or long term. Um, uh, projects, I'm thinking about the eight projects in the Accelerate, for instance, they are five, six year projects, most of them. And that gives some kind of sustainability in, in when you when you get employed there. there also, there's also a, a kind of money, you know, this money for, for a couple of years. And I think that's, that's very good for the community because that will, will be, that will make uh, scientists able to, to grow. Because I mean, there's a lot of background science being done it's not just the development of the drugs, but it's also a lot of backup science being done at the different academic sites and so on. So I think uh, as compared to if you get a grant for one or two years, it's more difficult to stay in there. But these long term uh, support we're seeing, I think that's that's really important for 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 this area. Great. And, and, and Douglas, do you, uh, is, is the people development an important part of your mission? Absolutely. I think that community piece we have in sort of the middle of the bridge for that reason. I think I, I loved Aaron's um, answer. Um, the way I describe that is, is, is a way that the Florian Kloss from our team talks about the mindset. Like how do you change the mindset of, of researchers to go, I'm going to do this. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to create a product and I'm going to become a drug developer. I'm not going to become a researcher. I'm going to develop a drug. And, and or I'm going to bring a diagnostic to market or whatever that is. And that mindset is what we'd like to see. So we hope we have a couple of ways to think about that. One of them is community and just connecting them to other people who've done it. We've seen here in, in the Basel region when when you see someone and you meet someone who's done the journey already, it's easy to imagine yourself doing it. Um, that, that's sort of one thing. So connect success to success. Um, the other is that we're sort of thinking about with industry partners is how do we bring them in? How do we share that industry talent? You know, maybe, you know, there's internships, there's other connections, but but sort of it's about 
all of those things will be about building community and changing mindset. Great, and and, and Igor, I know you. I asked you um, about this already, but um, you know what? What about the the companies that you're working with? Uh, it, it's the work that you do. Is that helping them to to recruit and and build their own expertise as well? I think it's the short answer is yes, because actually I would say we we're looking when we evaluate the projects we're looking mostly not at the people we're looking at the projects and we look whether this project has a commercial potential but when we work with the projects we work i would say not with the molecule we work with the people and we explain them and we work with them together to identify the issues in the project the moment so as you know the success rate is not very high for the projects so even if they fail with the with this exact project they definitely will have experience how to move forward and if there is a certain i would say solid flow of the scientific projects at the early stage then they will be the people that can move these scientific projects further so that's definitely extremely important but i would say the component of generating the flow of scientific project is also extremely important uh, to make all the system work excellent thank you uh, just uh uh erin uh, picking up on your comment there was a question in the in the chat from joanna about uh, geographic spread. You talked about the um, uh, the uh, your uh, accelerator network. Uh, for the for the benefit of everyone that's uh, not looked at your answer on there yet, would you mind expanding on that uh, and talking about um, reaching out beyond Europe and the US, but also mm -hmm. taking into account in the projects that that you take on the needs of um, less well-developed markets? Sure. So, um, you know, again, our global accelerator network today, um, you know, we, we have groups uh, in the U.S., we have groups uh, in the EU, uh, and also in India. Um, and I can comment specifically on India because I think it's a great example. Um, so the accelerator there is called CCAMP. And when they, when they first came to Carvex, we did not have a lot of applicants from India. And of course, as you know, um, you know there's a very heavy focus on science and technology, um, you know, from healthcare, IT, et cetera. And so um, they really worked to get the word out to explain what Carvex does. And as a result of that, we had a significant increase in very uh, high quality, actually, applications from India in all areas, tre treatment and prevention. Uh, and diagnostics, and and so I think that's an example of how um, you know we we can really continue to encourage innovation from wherever it, it exists. Um, in terms of of uh, the question about global need, you know this is something that you know we are um, you know we are are very serious about. Some of our funders, in particular, um, you know the Wellcome Trust, uh, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and the UK government, Gamma. Um, are, are very um, interested in the support of programs that will have the product characteristics to be used in low and middle income countries. Um, and so, you know, we, we try um, and certainly we, we now have a process that when people apply, um, if they feel that there is applicability for their program, you know, to, to go in that direction, that they describe that plan. Uh, and that we help them then to build upon that and keep them honest so that as the program progresses, it will be available uh, in both areas. I should also say as a final point, um, you know, Carvex has also had a very strong focus on stewardship and access, and Kevin um, Outerson speaks far more eloquently than I do about that. Um, but this year, uh, combined with Welcome Trust, we did uh, have a webinar and share an, a stewardship and access plan um, so that people can understand sort of when you need to do what and how to think about that and, and how to get help doing that um, you know, so that when our products come to market, um, you know, they can be uh, accessible to those around the world. Uh, excellent. Any of the other panel members want to comment on that? Yeah, I think I think it's really important and actually this morning we were at the swiss tph talking about um you know how do we work with them on building capabilities and understanding um 
how new therapies will fit into the broader landscape. And I think that that's really great. And and also um, earlier in the week, uh, the South, we're talking to the South African government, and they're very excited about how do they bring capabilities to South Africa, and and bring them into the, the sort of the global development team, so to speak. So I think that's also something that we as a community can think about, which is how are we bringing LMICs not as target markets but as co-developers. Great, and Anders, anything to add? Um, there's a, a, a really a really good question come in from uh, Karen, and that says, uh, you know, you're, "You're all managing portfolios of, of assets," and Karen said they they'd love to hear from the panel members about your experience of uh, of managing portfolios, uh, large and small. So, um, I Igor, if you you kick off, and then maybe Erin, you go last because you've got the biggest portfolio, I think. Yeah, sure. So uh, I will start with the smallest portfolio of, of a small biotech. So actually, it's a very good but a very hard question how you really identify, I would say, winners early. We can only base on the, I would say, on the scientific data. We can only look at what, what's in there and what are the risks. And we always try to develop, I would say, proper development program uh, for to identify potential models where you can see uh, first signals but in general uh, honestly saying I, I don't have this uh, proper answer to this question so what we actually do we try to find a solid science between the project to to find a real potential uh, in their relevant niche uh, so to find an unmet medical need and to understand that this scientific approach could be a solution and if we do believe from the scientific point of view if we see the feasible way to move up forward we need to try and then we will see whether it works or not okay thank you uh, Douglas um, I've had no failures in my portfolio where we have a hundred percent success rate we don't have any money <laughs> Um, but um, that the, the, the idea uh, actually is that we have industry partners. Industry are great at killing things. They're great at, at knowing this question. That's, that's the value that they provide to the ecosystem is actually knowing when to kill things. So we're very happy to bring in those industry partners to try and improve selection. And like I said, in our selection committee, we'd also like to bring a diverse view as well. Because I think a combination of sort of discipline and diversity will be successful, and I hope to tell you that you know a great story in in a few years' time. But I think I'm more excited about learning from from Aaron and others with more experience. Uh, that's 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 the benefit of having these panels that we can uh, share those experiences. And Anders, at, at you know the Karen's question, have we learned more about how to pick winners yet? It, it, it's a great question. Uh, it's extremely difficult to answer. We all know that uh, drug discovery is a very, there's, there's always a surprise behind the next corner. And uh, in the accelerator, uh, all the projects kind of came, came in before. I had no, no, no input there. But in my other life as the coordinator of, of the Enable project, uh, which really evaluated uh, uh, antibacterial projects and, and kind of move them from HIT all the way to through phase one clinical studies. Uh, I would say that there were so many surprises and so difficult to anticipate who would be moving forward and who would be facing a, 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 so a roadblock, so to say. So, but I, I, also say, I also think that building on the experience from uh, FBI, uh, that's one of my learnings, uh, is, is really important. and. They have so much knowledge and and uh, really know what works and does not work. Not in all cases, but in in very many cases, there's such an experience there. So I think that's really important to make use of. As long as the old drug antibacterial drug discoverers, there's discoverers are still around, so to say, because they are moving into other areas and we're losing them and and we're losing this big knowledge. So that that's a pity. So it's important that we educate the next generation, as as we already discussed. Great, and uh, and Erin, you know, uh, 
are picking winners. Are, are there any early indicators that, from your experience of the projects that are likely to be the most successful? This is a question I think I get asked every day. <laughs> um, but but I think we've learned a few things. So, um, you know, we like to think about the projects in our portfolio as com being comprised of the jockey and the horse, right? And with the horse, that's the science, the technology, the program. And at the outset, you hope it's a horse, might end up being a donkey. This is something you're going to learn over time. Um, but the jockey is critical. And, and early, you know, you don't need a program to have all of the capabilities necessary to bring something through first in human. But you do need a core of people who understand, you know, the base of what they have in the data. And those people need to sort of exercise, I guess, both scientific humility and scientific curiosity. Um, and, and then, again, work with our network around them. But I would say as the program progresses, you know, the critical thing is for the team to really buy into, um, you know, the, the, the North Star, the direction, the target product profile, and to be very honest with themselves and, and with us when things are sort of taking a left-hand turn. Doesn't mean you can't do, you know, some work to get it back on track, but if you get to the place, and I mentioned this earlier, where your target product profile you know, as much as you believe in this program, and I've been there, it almost becomes a religion, but rather to say, this is no longer meeting an unmet need in a way that will be valuable to patients, and to be honest about that and stop. And so we've seen people who can do that very well, um, and, you know, give them a lot of kudos. There are others who are tenacious, they get it, but they're going to do it, and they do. And then there are others who just want to keep it going, despite the fact that it's just not going to make it into a product that is has got legs. So, so, so the answer, as, as usual, is that you're investing. All of you are investing in the people as well as the programs. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, look, can I can I move on to uh, the question um, that I think was was flagged up, Erin, uh, on uh, the opportunities between various initiatives to co-build some of the un underpinning platforms. I mean, that's certainly something we're, we're trying to do in the ICON consortium in the UK. So we, we have uh, our, um, our, our probably more than 10 platforms now that are being developed within that, including um, new preclinical models, you know, validated preclinical models for, for relevant diseases. And so I just I just wonder if you could comment uh, uh, and and have a discussion between yourselves on what, what you see the the opportunities for co-developing some of those underlying platforms and, and networks and, and skill sets uh, that that can uh, uh, amplify and magnify the the efforts of each of our individual in initiatives Erin, you're, you're, you're still live so if you could kick off Sure. I think, you know, again, we we had started this, you know, idea and obviously we're not alone just by recognizing that when you have a group of product developers who all hit the same question. And so, you know, they could all put a unit of work in their plans to look at what in vitro models are best, what in vivo models are best. Um, but investing in that over and over again seems kind of silly. And so if you can take it out, this isn't basic science. This is science that is informing a product to move forward. And so you know, we kicked off the initiatives that we did, but then you know, organically we learned about you know different groups doing the same thing. And, and Karen, you know, Dwyer, who you know was here and asked the question early, you reached out and said, hey, there must be things that we could do together. And why not? Because in the end, it's not just about for the programs in portfolio, but we want to find a way to share the learnings through publication, through sharing of materials so that you know it's an ecosystem boost not an individual project or an individual portfolio boost and so i you know I, I encourage us to do that i don't know what the right forums to do that are but certainly um you know again the duplication of effort is really silly if we could come together and identify best practices and, and best ways of getting it done and uh douglas igor anders I mean, what I think Erin summarized it very well there. The key is how, how do we get 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 ourselves together? It hasn't been easier the last year and a half 
uh, not being able to to kind of meet in a in a normal fashion. So uh, there are many things popping up, many things happening, uh, and probably there are duplications and difficult to kind of keep track of everything. So, but I don't have the answer to how how we should how we sh should manage this. Uh, maybe someone else in the panel has a good 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 uh, idea of that. Douglas. Oh, Eko, Eko, you're live. <laughs> oh, thank you. So uh, actually, I, I would say in this case, we would probably need to look for synergies, not for saying, okay, we duplicate A or B. So I would say if we duplicate the financing, for example, none of the startups will say, so no, 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 stop doing this. So uh, if we duplicate the resources in terms of identification, then we actually probably I think need to discuss this directly and to see some synergies here to understand where every party could benefit from that. Yeah, Douglas. Um, I, I, I'm looking forward to having a portfolio of companies that can use these shared resources and, and more efficiently and faster bring things to market. And I think, you know, that's that's the plan. I'm sure the academic members of our team can help support build those capabilities as well. Um, but I think maybe by doing it, we'll learn to share things together. I think that's, you know, I think often just beginning to work together um, might move things forward. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm hearing a very strong desire for some sort of forum to allow this to happen. So I, I think we should take that as an action uh, from this from this from this panel to to go away and make it happen because I think there there is the potential for so much um, productive development of, of some of the under, underpinning platforms as you say Erin that we don't we don't want to invent over and over and again and and you don't want to fund their invention over and over again so you know it, with, if everybody's willing, let's let's try and find a way of doing that offline uh, after the event. Uh, looking and, looking and, forward to your invitation to Audley Park, Peter. Well, it's made, it, it maybe is something that we could we could initiate under the Icon umbrella as well. So I'll I'll raise that with Janet and and hopefully she can do that. Um, look, we're we're uh, heading towards the last five minutes. Um, what I'd like to do is throw out, uh, given given all of your experience in. Yeah, understanding uh, and getting a feeling for the landscape out there. And um, what is it that's maybe exciting you the most? That you know the the technologies that you maybe hadn't thought of two, three, four years ago. What's exciting you the most? And uh, and you know the things that you're looking forward to supporting over the next few years. Obviously, without without naming any particular companies, but more the the technology areas and and you know some of the exciting things that you might be seeing in academia. Uh, Anders, if you could kick us off, please. Yeah, that was difficult. Uh, so I think that uh, from my perspective, I'm very much focused in my own research group on early hit discovery, finding finding good starting points for, for antibacterial development. I know it's extremely difficult to do that. I've been doing this for 20 years both in the TB area and the gram-negative area, and I think we, we found one compound worth developing further. Uh, so I, I really would like to see techniques helping us to identify those good starting points, because, because I mean, that, that, that's where it all starts. And uh, we, we kind of had some work towards DNA encoded libraries as, as a way to, to kind of find starting points. Uh, when I talk to my microbiology colleagues, they say we really would need more information about genetics on, on species that are not so well understood in order to kind of do better research there, to do better uh, hit findings. So uh, I think there's a lot of, of, of uh, that part where I, where I would, which I find very exciting. But where do we find these hits? That, that's my, that's, that's my what driving force, but I, I don't have any really good, good, good decisive DNA encoded libraries that we work with a little bit. And uh, Erin, you know, if you if Carbex is 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 refunded, uh, you know what what are the exciting things that you see uh, coming down the pike? 
You know, I think what, what we're very um, interested in doing now that we do have this portfolio is asking, you know, not so much on the technology side or are we missing a technology or even a modality because I think we've invested, um, you know, very broadly, you know, in, in innovation as I described, but rather where are those pockets of unmet need and can we address those from a portfolio wide point of view? You know, so we have prevention, we have treatment, we have diagnosis that can really make a difference in those areas. And, you know, we're seeing some of these, um, you know, that are, you know, coming up. I'll give you an example um, that, that is something we're very proud of in portfolio. I don't think we designed it this way, but, you know, we can say we did. Um, but, you know, you look at this unmet need of drugs, prevention and diagnostics for drug resistant gonorrhea. You know, we have not had an NCE um, for instance, that has been approved in what, six, in at least 40 years or something like that. Um, and we now have three treatment programs, all novel class, novel mechanism, uh, all focused on oral therapy. We have a prevention program in the form of a vaccine. And we have three really interesting ID and AST diagnostic programs that are focused not only on, again, you know, certain healthcare systems, but really all levels so that they can be deployed um, in high and low middle income countries. And so that's the kind of thing we want to do is ask where are the, where's the holes for patients and then how do we call uh, to fill those? Excellent. And uh, uh, Douglas, um, you don't have anything in your portfolio yet, but what are the things that, that are exciting you that are out there? Um, I, I'm going to keep referring to Aaron on any question. He usually <laughs> has a much better answer than I do. Um, but I think... Um, Look, I, I'm looking forward to seeing what, what turns up in the portfolio. So, you know, in whatever's in my inbox tomorrow morning, I hope is going to be the next big thing. Um, and, and, and we'll get back to those and, and work with those people in, in the next um, next few years. Um, so, and I, Sandra's hovering, so I'll be quiet. And, and uh, Adam, we're, we're almost up, but I have to give Igor a chance to, um, as he's not answered that last question. Igor, you know, the... the uh, the great new technology that you, you that you hope to come across your desk in 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 the next year. What would that be? Uh, actually, anything that would fit our I would say uh, target product profile. So we actually we I can only agree with Aaron that we need to think not from the really from technology, but from the I would say from the problem. So. Just to give you an example, I would say like in bloodstream infection and sepsis, that's a, there is a huge problem. And one of the problem is that you need to kill bacteria extremely fast to avoid, I would say, prevent people from dying. And here it's more like from our point of view, we can say maybe there is not too much room for conventional antibiotics. We need to find something super fast killing. And then I would say any technologies that uh, would do the job would fit here. So. Excellent. Thank, well, thank you all. That that hour, hour, hour and, a, and a bit seems to have flown by. So, uh, Anders, Erin, um, Douglas and Igor, thank you very much for your expert contribution. Um, enlightening and entertaining as always. And uh, back over to Sandra. Yeah, thank you very much uh, from all of you for your expertise and great to see that also uh, cross accelerator collaboration may start now a bit more in the future. I think that's maybe a good uh, talking point also for our next year's in-person conference and in, in April uh, to see where we are then and maybe there, there are some smaller initiatives already starting now and then pop up next year as a big collaboration also that would be great but for this year in the summer edition i also invite you then for tomorrow's session which is of course one of the biggest topics right now pull incentives and where we are and where we go and so on so also we will have some really good insights from new reports and uh, from the pilots that are running so yeah Hopefully, we will see each other then tomorrow afternoon again or morning if you are sitting in the UN. So then, see you there. <laughs>